Wanna see justice. I wanna see justice. I wanna see justice. I wanna see justice. I wanna see justice. Nine water Thank you all and welcome uh, to the November statewide meeting of the Wisconsin Poor People's Campaign. Uh, my name is Danielle Tai. Um, I'm here in Madison where we've got some cold and snowy weather. Um, so thanks so much for joining us tonight. Um, and special welcome to those who maybe it's your first time. Thank you for being here. Um, we really are grateful for, for your presence and, and need, need to have you with us in this fight. So thank you so much for being here. Um, we're gonna start tonight by grounding ourselves for just a couple of minutes in who we are as the Poor People's Campaign, what we believe in and why we do this work. So as the Wisconsin Poor People's Campaign, we recognize that the fundamental problem of our time is the growing concentration of wealth and power in the hands of a few, while the majority is dispossessed. We lift up the voices of poor and low wealth workers as leaders in this movement, uniting across all lines of division to advocate and organize for policies that fight the interlocking injustices of poverty, systemic racism, ecological devastation, militarism, and the distorted moral narrative of religious nationalism. We believe that everybody has the right to live and to thrive. So we fight for healthcare as a human right. We fight for affordable and accessible housing. We fight for living wages and a universal basic income. We fight for inclusive anti-racist policies. 
and we fight for healthy communities free from violence and environmental degradation. Many of you know that the Wisconsin PPC hosted our first uh, structured study in August and September with a focus on healthcare as a human right. And this will also be the focus of our meeting tonight. The PPC understands how the fight for healthcare is interconnected with poverty. We know that poverty is a major contributor to ill health and a barrier to accessing health care when needed. Medical costs are skyrocketing and millions of Americans struggle with medical debt. And as we'll hear more about tonight, millions in this country are also at imminent risk of losing their Medicaid coverage at a time when quality health care is more important than ever. The PPC is proud to be a part of the nonviolent Medicaid army that is growing across this country to fight for health care for all and to expose those who only see health care as a business and who seek to profit from our suffering. Our goal tonight is to have each of us identify at least one action we can take to support the health care as a human right campaign and several action ideas will be shared throughout the meeting. We'll hear from our friends at our Wisconsin Revolution about some incredible work that they're doing uh, to get health care for all on the ballot in counties throughout the state. We'll learn about ways that you can collect and share valuable information about health care in your local community. And But first, we're going to start um, by highlighting our first action, which is the power of our stories. We each have at least one story that we can share about how we've been impacted by a for-profit healthcare system that doesn't put people first. Telling our stories brings us together and inspires us to change or to fight for change. So let's all uh, listen closely to our PPC member and organizer, Barbara, who will share the first testimony for tonight about why healthcare is a human right. So Barbara, please tell us your story. I'm an Anishinaabe woman from Chicago and lived in Milwaukee. I live in Wisconsin Rapids now. Uh, my family is from Mashkee um, Zabing, which is Bad River up by Lake Superior. And some of my relatives still live up there. Um, and uh, uh, being Na Native American gives me a little bit of a perspective on healthcare um, because of my own grandmother, I never got to meet her because uh, when she was having a medical emergency, she could not be seen at the local hospital that which was 15 miles away from the reservation back in the 1920s. She had to try to go 60 miles away um, and she died on the way. So this healthcare story goes along in our family, you know, the grief over um, people not being able to get healthcare that they need is part of all of our lives. And we all know people whose lives were cut short uh, by inadequate health care or inadequate access to health care. And um, in my, my life right now, uh, I am on kidney dialysis and, and I was put there by the health care system because uh, I was a good patient. I did what the doctors told me to do to treat some chronic conditions I have. And by doing those very things, taking the medications, the medications backed up in my system. And, and that is why I need dialysis now. So three times a week I go and I put my life on the line every time. And it's very scary. Um, I'm sitting in a chair for three hours, three times a week. Uh, 25 other people there the staff trying madly to rush between patients to get people on and people off their treatments. Uh, hopefully nobody has an emergency that needs an ambulance call, but there have been days where two or three people needed to have ambulances called to, you know, to take them 
to a, a hospital rather than the clinic. So it's a very scary system where I feel like I have no control over it. I don't have control over where I get my treatment because the next nearest place would be 30 miles away um, or more. Um, and it's a for-profit system where the top executives make not even 100 times, but 350 times what their average staff member makes. And, and over the last year and a half, we have had um, almost 100% turnover in the staff that takes care of us. So every day somebody is taking care of me that is doing things for the first time. And that's very scary. I, don't, I feel like I have to know all of the little ins and outs of everything. And it's, it's really complex, complex, complex chemistry and that I have to teach them. Otherwise, they're going to mess up and I could end up dead. You know, it's very scary. Um, but in, in some ways, that isn't the worst of it. The worst of it is that there, there are people now, I learned um, in Jackson, Mississippi, who they can't even get their dialysis there because their, their water system is so bad that they, they don't have clean water to run their machines, their kidney machines. So they have to go an hour and a half away to get their dialysis. Um, there are some communities where there simply are not enough dialysis machines available. You know, the care isn't there at all. And I know that people die prematurely because of kidney disease. Um, and we, uh, kidney patients are lucky. We get covered by Medicare from the time that we are diagnosed. Um, but it is because it is a for-profit system. I mean, they changed one of our medications. It's simply vitamin D, you know, that you can buy over the counter just because they found a cheaper way to give it to us. <laughs> so it, it, the four pro and there are labs are collected and sent to Florida. And during the hurricanes, of course, they couldn't process our lab work because it was in Florida. So it's, it's an insane system. It's inefficient. And that's what's wrong with this whole system we have. It's inefficient, it's unfair, it's cruel, and it's inhumane, both for the work and for the patients. Um, and I, I really stand with everyone who's fighting to bring about a better system where in no other advanced country do you have to worry about your medical bill or can you go bankrupt or, you know, have to just Side between uh, do I do I go get get myself checked out when I when I hurt myself um, or face a thousand dollars in medical bills just for a short visit? You know, well, my friend the other day told me that ten minutes of lab work cost her a thousand dollars of unpaid bills that she doesn't have the money for. So it, it's just an insane system. Um, so I want to join with everyone who is trying to make this better. And um, I know that we are going to do this if we just work together and join with other people throughout our country and don't let things divide us. So, you, Miigwech. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. Um, yeah. And, you know, we, we say in the campaign um, that somebody has been hurting our people and it's been gone on far too long. Um, That's right. And we can't be silent anymore. 
and you know the things that um, Barbara shared with us. Um, a lot of things stuck out. You know um, that she's that, that she's more scared of this system, and not able to focus on her on her overall need, and that is her health. Um, scary system, time and time again, is what she she was saying, right? And and obviously, you know, she also talked about that this is something that shouldn't divide us. Um, you know, healthcare is um, nonpartisan. Uh, we all want um, better quality care, better quality health. And so, um, Barbara, thank you for you know sharing your story. Um, obviously, it's not a good story to hear. Um, and that's why we're all here for. We're all here for better um, across different counties, um, wherever we live in this state, wherever we live in this nation. Like we all deserve better health care. Um, and as we go into um, this next 20, 25 minutes of time, um, we'll be moving into breakout rooms um, where we'll be sharing just, you know, what is your healthcare story? Like, what are the impacts that you see in your community, in your space? How is it affecting you, you your family, um, those that you love? Um, and what does it look like for us to, to, to get better um, for each other? And so... You know, as you go out into these breakout rooms, um, we'll have that question put in the chat um, of what to kind of focus on in that space. Definitely introduce yourself, um, share who you are, or where, what area of the state you, you're in, um, and let's uh, spend some time talking together a little bit. Welcome back, everybody. Um, I know we had some really interesting conversations um, in our group. Um, so we'd like to hear from some of you what you heard in your group. Um, I was in group one. Do we have anybody in group two who would like to um, share a, a, a story? Who is in group two, please? Can you raise your hand? Was that us? Oh, that was us. Okay. <laughs> well, I okay. was. I was just going to say, I, I thought. I mean, we got to hear a little bit more um, from Barb about um, uh, one of her friends who um, has also been struggling with. Um, Healthcare, she has coverage, but not enough. Um, and so is always concerned about whether or not she should um, go and get certain procedure or if she's sick enough to go in and, and see the doctor because she's concerned about the health care bills that she will, she may, um, she may have as a result of that. Um, we also talked a little bit about, you know, what we can do um, to make things better. Um, and had the suggestion of, you know, that this is something obviously fiscally responsible because we know that this broken healthcare system that we have costs a lot of money. Um, and so um, being able to, um, for those who may be a little bit more fiscally conservative looking at um, focusing on um, the cost savings and the efficiencies that could come with a healthcare system um, that really is for everybody. So had had some interesting conversation around some things we, we could do to make things better as well. How about group two? Does anybody remember who was in group two? Remember what your that we were a group, we were group two. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, group three. Who's Trenton? Who else was in three? I can't see uh, Trenton, Sarah, and Russell. Anybody want to share a story there? Well, we had all kind of um, interesting, different experiences on different kind of chunks and pieces of the healthcare system, Medicare, Medicaid, private insurance, you know, and I think the fact that all of us have had pretty like 
you know, challenges in all of those areas, I guess one kind of lesson to draw from those stories together is that, you know, that it's really uh, across the board that, that particularly, you know, the profit motive in healthcare is really hurting people. And it's not just one thing that needs to be tweaked, but it's the whole system across um, all these different situations. Um, and another th kind of theme that came up for us a lot, and feel free to jump in, Trent or Russell, but just was that uh, that uh, you know I think Trenton said it very well several times that it's just not really a left versus right; it's right versus wrong, um, and um, that that you know resonates with people and uh, has a lot of potential for to bring people together. Yeah. Um... I can just add to uh, what Sarah was saying a little bit. Like, I'm on Medicaid, but I'm 25. And so my life compared to, I think, a lot of people in the States is just, you know, even in this state, it's just starting out, more or less. And um, I just graduated from college last year. And I was exposed to a lot of different people who had a lot of different um, things to say about healthcare um, in general, not just Medicare for all, but uh, politics in general. But um, really, I think it comes down to if you can't, you know, like the song said, if you're not healthy, you can't get a job and go to school. If you're not healthy, you don't become a productive member of society. <laughs> um, and it's really difficult um, dealing with, I think, the long-term effects of, of COVID, of inflation, kind of hitting us with the big one-two punch, and just all this stuff together, um, you know, uh, is leading to revealing that the system was always broken. Everything we've always been saying was um, suddenly people are paying attention to it because the system as it was just stopped working. And, uh, you know, I think we just have to keep pushing until we get the pressure on our elected leaders to actually do what we need them to do. But that's um, that's about it. That's what we gotta do. That's what we gotta do. Um, how are we? Um, we're, how are we doing with number four group? If we have four groups, right? I think, I think so. there's four groups. Okay, so for, for group four would be Adrian, Nujimi, Becky. Was there anybody else in group four? Adrian, okay. So Femi, Becky, and Adrian. Can we have a readout from them, please? I can start with that. Um, I think something that stuck out uh, was that Adrian was sharing that um, the basicness of like Walgreens in the community. Um, and his Walgreens, his local Walgreens is, is going to be shutting down. Um, and just how that is uh, a huge, important space for people with prescriptions and just access to those needed um, life saving um, drugs um, to, to live. And so, like, um, that closing is a huge inconvenience for his for his community um and you know is that a 24-hour uh, walgreens is that like there's so many factors that play into that um of people's um need you know i think of that my walgreens is like literally around the corner from me i can walk there you know and so like um that burden of like getting what you need when you need it um is critical um and should be accessible for all of us easily. 
especially those uh, in rural areas, as uh, Becky was pointing out as well, um, she, where, where she lives. So. Uh, anybody else from that group want to say, say something? I'm off mute. Okay, then group one was Bruce, um, me, uh, let's see, who else was in there? I'm sorry, I'm blanking right now. Bruce, me, John, John. Yeah. and Natalia. And Natalia. So would one of you want to do a summary? I can briefly share. Can people hear me? Uh, just briefly, you know, similarly, we all had different, like, different stories, but in general, you know, one story of somebody who, who escaped the nightmare of healthcare injustices because he was lucky enough to be under Medicaid, and then a bunch of other stories from you know, be, in being in the professions of healthcare to personal stories, uh, to family member stories of just how much the system is really made to be against us and that people are hired to be kind of robots of profit making for somebody else. And the cruelty that we can experience from employees that are caught into this, um, that are really just kind of making making, you know, they're pieces of a puzzle that, that this process us all. So very similar to what's been said and, and, you know, important to recognize that that's something that unites us in our group focus from all over the state. Good summary. It's, these are all powerful stories and I know in our group, when people tell their stories, it's very heartfelt. And um, John was saying that uh, in doing canvassing, um, it really unites us across um, rural urban and blue and red is that um, everybody has a healthcare story. And if it isn't them themselves, it's a family member or a close, Friend, these are very painful stories for people to live through and sharing them has great power. So um, we're going to move next to um, a summary of our healthcare um, study, which we had this summer. And can you share the screen and get the slides up? Um, I'm I'm looking at my script now, so Danielle, just tell me when you have it up. Yeah, it's up. Okay. So Wisconsin Poor People's Campaign decided to develop a healthcare study in the summer of 2020 with the goal of this introductory course to deepen understanding of the healthcare system and how to organize around this issue that is critical and in fact life-threatening for the poor and dispossessed. Um, this study was designed to connect with the National Week of Action of the Nonviolent Medicaid Army. And that week of action was September 12th to 18th. Our study covered five weeks preceding that week of action from August 8th to September 6th. And we had about 26 people registered for the course that came from three different states. We studied healthcare for profit. First, how um, slide one, how fundamental shifts in the economy caused by automation and deindustrialization impacted the struggle for healthcare. Next slide, please. We learned that unions, which were 35% of the working population after World War II, fought for universal health care, but settled for employer-based insurance 
which was subsidized by the government as a tax exempt income. And this was a private public um, partnership. The insurance companies found that this was very profitable because they had more patients and insurance industry grew. Many unionized workers and their families required care, partially because of toxins and, and injuries in the workplace, but also just regular care. So the hospitals were central to communities. At times, hospitals were even a place of respite for elderly and infirm. For example, if a physician, a, pra a practitioner knew that a family was struggling with the care of a family member, they would hospitalize that person for a couple of weeks to give the family a break. So these hospitals were, this was care, healthcare for people. Next slide, please. Because these services drove up costs for non-union union poor workers and elderly, these groups advocated for care resulting in governmental initiation of Medicaid and Medicare in 1965. The unintended consequence of this positive expansion of coverage was also expansion of costs. Next slide, please. To control the costs in the late 70s, the government started payment for individual services, ranking them in value. So some procedures were more productive cost-wise than others. This led to more specialization in medical services. For example, instead of family practice, internal medicine, more surgical, instead of general surgery, um, specialized surgery, like pulmonary surgery and so forth. This led to investment in very expensive equipments like MRIs and so forth, and larger hospitals with the goal of a high number of beds filled with quick, high cost treatments. This process accomplished the movement from healthcare for people to healthcare for profit. We also studied the uh, um, movement of health, um, the status of healthcare in Wisconsin. Um, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, um, before the pandemic, there were approximately 2 million poor and low income people accounting for 35% of its population. So if you think about your town being 10,000 people, that means about a third of those 3,000 people would be in the low income or poor category. Um, 49 percent, almost half of the poor in Wisconsin are children, 71 percent Black people, 62 percent Latino, and 32 percent white. So it is a disproportionate um, uh, representation of people of color. Next slide, please. And before the pandemic, um, almost 30 million people in the United States were uninsured, including 27,000 in Wisconsin. Next. And with the public health emergency, if it um, is discontinued, about 300,000 people in Wisconsin will be kicked off of um, Medicaid. This is seven, 16 million people uh, nationwide. Next slide, please. Um, Wisconsin is one of the only 12 states that you can look at the map that did not expand Medicaid under the under ACA. And most of the states that did not um, expand Medicaid were in the South. Um, although the state care system, Badger Care, attempts to fill the gap, 
A 2020 analysis found that 120,000 uninsured people in Wisconsin would gain access to Medicaid if the, if the state accepted federal funding to fully expand coverage. Next slide, please. Um, one moment, I'm gonna get back to my um, strip. So um, in each study session, we had breakouts where people will reflect on how their healthcare stories are part of a broken system that does not meet the needs of need, meet the needs of either patients or providers. Um, during the the study, we also heard from organizers from Vermont Workers Center and put people first, EA, on how they had worked on healthcare over many years, reflecting on the history and struggles of groups over the years helps people situate the history. Finally, we explored what we might do individually or together during the week of action, September 12th to the 18th, guided by the toolkit provided by the nonviolent Medicaid Army. Uh, people could join national meetings online of the national nonviolent Medicaid Army or putting people first Pennsylvania. We offered templates of letters to the editor on healthcare issues. We produced postcards to President Biden, asking him to continue the public health emergency order and keep people on Medicaid who accessed it during the pandemic. And we distributed these throughout the state as an advocacy and awareness campaign. We planned a group presence to support the UW nurses strike on September 13th. And we had a speaker, Bruce, ready to express support for them and speak. Um, the strike ended in a positive way on September 12th, but we submitted the letter of support to them as a measure of our commitment. And we also invited people to share their story on We Won't Be Silent Anymore project, which you will hear about later. Next slide, please. What are some of the outcomes of the study? Uh, we form connections with organizations and activists in other states. We uh, develop recognition of Wisconsin PPC as providing an introductory study course on healthcare as a human right. We develop new leaders who are interested in joining the struggle. We expanded speaking opportunities. Uh, one of the people who took the course and who provided um, information about uh, how uh, the, the narrative that you have to pay for health care and that's the only way it works uh, is a man named Wayne Scadham, and he shared his health care story at a Get Out the Vote event in Beloit, Wisconsin which was attended by the national people who asked him then to um, contribute his story online for a national poor people's campaign event. And finally, uh, there's a continuation of the focus on health care by devoting this meeting to it. Um, so we, we felt like um, we were pleased with the results of our health care study. Um, we felt like we got good responses and we had um, the surveys showed that people felt uh, that it was worthwhile and um, they learned a lot. So um, we are satisfied and pleased that we did the healthcare study. And I'm going to turn it over to Megan now. Thank you. Wasn't as quick on my unmute button as I thought I would be. Um, so thank you to everyone who has shared tonight and helped bring us all together as well. Um, I'd like to take a couple of minutes to share my own reflection and what has brought me to find a place with the PPC. 
I've come to learn that the Poor People Campaign is working to create a moral fusion movement. Organizers around the country are actively lifting up the voices of those that are impacted by policies that do so little to protect poor, low wage, disabled, or black and brown folks living in this country. And by that definition, I am not an impacted person. I have been fortunate and so privileged living in this body, living in this country, but I am part of a wider definition. I am a person that is impacted by the injustices that I witness. And those that I am seen to consent to or even sanction in my role as a PA or physician assistant working in this broken healthcare system. I graduated from PA school in 2004 and I've been working with people with diabetes for almost 20 years. I've worked in outpatient clinics and our hospital systems to help educate and empower folks, try and inspire them to care for themselves every day to do what they need to do to stay healthy. But what I found myself asking was, how can I keep doing this in good conscience? When our government representatives, our social support systems, and our for-profit healthcare system are not helping me to take care of them too. I have seen how the price of insulin has increased so dramatically over the last 15 years that people are frequently rationing their insulin supply or going without treatment entirely. I am bombarded with advertising and drug reps who are talking about new and exciting treatments that could honestly have such a positive impact on our population's health, only to discover that they too are wildly expensive and out of reach for my patients. While participating in this PPC healthcare study this summer and fall, I've learned how deeply the system of profiteering by the ruling class is embedded and protected in our healthcare industry and in our government. Most often I meet these impacted folks just after they've had an amputation or a heart attack or a life-threatening infection. I work with them. They understand how to manage their diabetes, how to exercise, how to eat, what meds to take. And then I watch as they're discharged to a homeless shelter or to an empty mobile home with no electricity or to a friend's house with a cab voucher or to an underfunded, understaffed nursing facility that they are terrified to go to. And some of them won't have a place to sleep or food to eat or a way to get their medications. And they won't have a car or gas money to make it to appointments and no one they know will have that either. So I'm ashamed of the industry that I'm paid by, but I'm still and always looking for ways to actually help folks instead of harm them or what might be worse to simply ignore the challenges that so many people are facing just trying to stay well. All of us working in these broken systems can help to lift up the voices of those that are impacted. And I think that includes our own. If we can unite all the definitions of impacted, if we can unite and stand together in this, we can make it change. So thank you for listening tonight. And switching to the more informational segment. <laughs> um, so as I said, I participated in the healthcare study offered by the Wisconsin PPC this fall. And part of the learning and sharing of experience involved hearing about the work of Put People First PA and thanks to Danielle and Harrison, who was part of that group, we were introduced to the idea of a landscape assessment. 
as a way of grounding the organizing that the PPC can do in Wisconsin. So Brittany, if you wanna bring up the slide that I created, I just got the one so you can look at something else while I'm talking. There it is. So a county healthcare landscape assessment uh, could be a good way for anyone new to the PPC or just interested in what their local healthcare issues are to build a foundation of knowledge about their area or their county and to provide a framework for others to help collect ideas and to record any responses to outreach in a given area, which is something that we could hope to do. The assessments would be living documents that would continue to change, be refreshed or retired as needed. And I was interested to learn more about Dane County where I live. And so I adapted the assessment that we borrowed from Put People First and then completed it with just the beginning, but what I could find about Dane County. And so I thought tonight I would take a minute to share that all with you. And so Brittany, you could bring up the link to the Dane County assessment that I created. And again, all credit to Put People First PA for this. And I can just sort of let you know to scroll down. I think um, I really appreciated even just having a map of the county to sort of be reminded of what is in this location. And I grew up in Madison. And so it was helpful to sort of be reminded of what communities are part of this county. So you have a map and then um, you could scroll down a little bit, Brittany, and with the Google search and the use of a website that's linked here, Data USA, um, they have a pretty nice summary set of summary pages where I could pull the population and the poverty rate, the median household income for a specific county. So this could be done um, anywhere some summary data about the ethnic groups represented in the county, common industries, and then they have a whole page that talks about sort of the state of healthcare in that county. So, you know, good to see that 96% of the population of Dane County has health coverage, um, but that it is, you know, focused on these employee plans, some Medicaid, Medicare, or other, uh, plans, including the VA. Um, I did, a, after one of our conversations, another Google search for the county operating budget, just to know how much money is going to the bucket of health and human services. And for just Dane County last year, a stunning $265 million. So we're trying uh, in a broken system, right? So then if you scroll down, and thanks to Daniil for this link, looking at the most disadvantaged areas, and even living in Madison, this was a little bit of a surprise to me. These are the most disadvantaged areas in the county. They are all in Madison. In a couple of places I might have predicted, and at least one or two that were a surprise to me. So in thinking about future outreach work that PPC could do, it felt helpful to know where some of these neighborhoods are. I wanted to make an acknowledgement of the indigenous history of the area and um, so borrowed from the UW Madison's land acknowledgement for a recognition of the space that we're actually in and looking at. And then more Googling, scrolling down, Brittany, there's the cities, there's and towns by population. I was stunned to discover how much Sun Prairie has grown since my vision of it as a kid. It's a large contributor to the population. I looked for the primary health care systems in the county. So you'll see those listed there and the idea that there is Dane County Public Health as an organization and resource. You can keep scrolling down, Brittany, because this is where it gets a little bit lighter. 
but some community resources that I felt like I was familiar with that we could add to some places to look for online resources, places to hold uh, recent news. Um, one example being, you know, the Department of Health and Human Services uh, reviewing public equity, essentially um, purchasing our managed care organizations that affect the residents of this area. Um, and so wanting to call that out or stay tuned in to how that is developing and how that's impacting our population. So I'm gonna experiment with ways of keeping up with the recent news in the area, thank you. Uh, Brittany, you could switch to the template and it's not very exciting, but you'll see the opportunity for adding to it because it's got all the headings and it just needs a county and a map and um, someone that might have interest in building up this foundation of information. So we have this template could be completed for different counties uh, from, and, and that could be folks that wanna look at their own area or if we have specific legislative targets uh, in different areas. And this is all of this always, right? Work in progress. So I'd be happy to hear any feedback on the template or how to keep sharing this information. And if there are folks today that would want to sort of tackle some of this, I'd invite you to email me directly. If there's enough interest, we could get a group together to talk about how to collect this information. I can share my approach so far, but also how to try and keep it meaningful. So thank you. And with that, I'll close, pass it on to the next Bruce. That was awesome, Megan. Appreciated your your story too. I can relay with a lot of what you were saying. Um, so this is always a kind of a fun part of the the meeting. Not that the rest of it hasn't been fun, but uh, we get to introduce our partner organizations and uh, connect with what they're doing. And uh, one of our goals is to try to figure out how we can continue to work together because we're not in this alone. And I wanted to uh, introduce John Calabrese. Uh, he told me to tell you that he's a woodworker. He's a member of the Dunn County Board of Supervisors. He's from Menominee, which is up the Northwest part of the state. Uh, and he's an organizer with our Wisconsin Revolution. I think he sits on committees for the environment and uh, healthcare. And I just personally have to add, as some of you have probably already noticed, he has such a such a calming voice and demeanor that he could he could put a frightened mouse at ease. So there you go, John. Put us at ease, but get us fired up at the same time, okay? Thank you, Bruce. I appreciate that. And I, I think it's uh I, I feel like it's appropriate for me to follow Megan. Uh, and I'll, I'll elaborate on that in a minute, but I'm just, I'm glad to be here and I'm glad to see so many people here this evening. Uh, and I've, I've really had a good time on this meeting. I had a good time in the, in the breakout room um, because it, this has been my focus in these last few months is hearing stories like I heard in that breakout room and, and the stories from the other rooms. Uh, it's just been inundating my life these last several months and uh so the reason i feel like it's it's good to follow megan is is her um her focus on the the county numbers and the the amount of money that dane county is spending on health insurance and so just to overview i'm an organizer with our wisconsin revolution and i'm also a dunn county supervisor as bruce mentioned and I've been on the county board in Dunn County for almost five years. And when I got hired on with OWR, uh, and we were just uh, sort of rebooting and re-focusing re, uh, the purpose of the organization and where we wanted to go after some upheaval last year, 
And the idea was that we would focus around issues and when make committees for each issue. And one of the issues was health care. And uh, what's fascinating in a rural uh, conservative leaning county and something that I just I, I, I couldn't get out of my mind is that uh, because I come from without getting into it too deep of a background of my life, I was raised in a conservative family. Uh, my mother was the Republican chair of uh, Livingston County, New York, where I grew up uh, of the county party. I stuffed envelopes for George Bush as a, as a little 10 year old kid, the first George Bush, not the second one. And so I, and then I moved here and there and I became really a lot more liberal and, and, um, and, but then I got on the county board, missing a whole chunk of my life in, in, in between there. And I saw this rural county board, like the county that went for Trump two times, a county that just every every uh, every person on the ballot a week ago, every Republican won. And so it would stand to reason that this county board is uh, 29 members, largely conservative. But what I see is that there is no political rancor. People don't argue about left or right issues. They, When you get to the county level, they have to balance the budget by state statute. Every county needs to balance the budget and they need to provide services that the, that the people of the county uh, expect. And people on the county board in Dunn County don't get paid any money. They get a little per diem for each meeting. They're not in it for the glory or the money. And I would see these people who I knew were conservative starting to understand how the budgets work, starting to understand what happens with the state constraints on each county. And I would see these, these conservative people be like, wait a minute, why are we not taking the Medicaid expansion? It's right there. If they don't take it, our county uh, nursing home is going to close because of the reimbursement rates. And so I would see people that I had Trump bumper stickers on their car put together a presentation for our, our state lawmakers at our special legislative meeting that we have every month and say, please take the Medicaid expansion. And so our idea was we want to bring uh, the topic of, of uh, national health insurance to the county boards uh, at a fiscal level, at a financial level, the, the things that speak to these people in rural, in rural communities, to the leaders in rural communities. And we brought it to Dunn County and and so many people from from the community came and spoke to the county board and said, uh, we don't want you in Dunn County to, we don't expect or want you to fix our national uh, healthcare system, obviously. But what we want is for you to put this question on the ballot for the people in Dunn County so that between now and July and November, everybody can start to have this conversation and maybe we can shift the conversation. And the question reads, shall Congress and the President of the United States enact into law the creation of a nonprofit publicly financed national health insurance program that would fully cover medical care costs for all Americans? And the people on the board voted unanimously to put that on the ballot because they were implored to just start the conversation because they know Dunn County, as opposed to Dane County, like Megan was mentioning, Dunn County spends a half a million dollars a month on health insurance. It's insane. And so you speak to the fiscal uh, priorities of the people on the board, and then you bring it out into the community. And I went to these places all across Dunn County uh, that I know have gone red year after year after year. And we drop literature and we talk to people and, and everybody has a story like we've been talking about this whole evening. And um, we, we passed the referendum uh, barely just by two points, but uh, Mandela Barnes did not win in Dunn County. Tony Evers did not win in Dunn County. We outperformed them by six points, eight points, 10 points, all the Democrats on the ballot because this issue speaks to everybody and it wasn't just about health insurance as i as I've, I've reflected over these last seven eight days um what was so moving for me was that uh you know all of us here are politically minded and so you probably get uh your fair share of, of national politics coming into your social media feeds and into your 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 world from wherever it does and 
And we're told to believe that there's such a divide in this country that it's insurmountable and that you, uh, not, not just that it's insurmountable, that there's, you know, a lot of people say you shouldn't even talk to your neighbors because because they're the problem and that we're supposed to be very skeptical and dubious of our neighbors. But um, I found that not to be the case. And so with this issue, uh, not only can we help, uh, you know, raise raise this issue to a point where, and I, I, I always say the same thing when people ask me about it. Uh, and I would talk to people as I went to doors, talk about it like you talk about the fire department. Because if you go and talk to anybody about the fire department and you ask, what do you think about the fire department? If they have a Trump flag in their, in their yard or otherwise, and they'll, you know, do that, they'll cock their head like a dog and they'll say, well, what do you mean? Uh, I like the fire department and because it's just, it's ubiquitous. It's just, it's natural. It's there. Of course, everybody likes the fire department. We need the fire department. Like, of course we do. And to talk about health insurance in that same vein, uh, it, it that's what we want to do. That's what we're trying to do to say that, of course we need it, but who's going to pay for it and how are we going to pay for it? And we didn't have a ton of time to get the message out thoroughly through the to the 50,000 people that live in Dunn County, but in the time we had, we got it out to enough people. And it was it was just such a wonderful experience uh, to go out there and listen. And so many people just need somebody to listen to them. And this is the issue that uh that unites everybody because it's not it's not a left or right issue. It's not a blue or red issue. It's a human issue. And I think it's not only uh, a way to, to make this uh, statewide, nationwide upheaval, uprising movement where uh, political parties are unable to ignore it. It's also a way to, to push those voices that are telling us that we're supposed to be divided and that we're supposed to fear our neighbor out of the way. Like, no, that's not true. We have a lot more in common uh, than we think we do. And uh, there's, there's a lot of money being made on uh, people telling us that we're supposed to, to fear our neighbor. And uh, and so the results in Dunn County have OWR um, moving to try to put this uh, ballot question on the ballot in a few other counties before the spring election. We don't have the capacity to really push it too much further than that because uh, state statute also says that um, in order to get something on the ballot in a county, you have to have it through all the county committees and the county board uh, 60 days before the election. And so, you know, time is flying. So we are um, pushing it in a few counties. We have interest in Douglas County, Marathon County, Rock County, potentially Outagamie County, and uh, many people some people on the uh, Poor People's Campaign have expressed interest in it, and we're, we're glad to be uh, collaborating potentially and, and working to move it forward. And um, to get out there and talk to people and hear everybody's stories is just, uh, it's, it's an honor. And as a staff member, I get paid for it, and I almost feel guilty for that, but, uh, but it's been great. And it's uh, it's great to be here with all of you. And if anybody has any questions about the campaign or uh, or where we're going moving forward, then uh, I'll I'll answer those. I don't want to take up too much time, but yeah, we probably got time for a couple questions or just comments or anything. And if not, or comments, sure. No offense. <laughs> Yeah, we've been finding a lot of um, a lot of people who vote for Trump are poor people. So you know, what you did just kind of underscores how we can connect with people over issues and how we can unite over those differences and those fabricated divisions. Yeah, and and if I can just real quick, Bruce, something I said to people because I noticed it <clears throat> was I would say. There is a, a United States president who said the following. 
and I think the year was 2015. Uh, nobody's going to have to worry about health insurance. Everybody's going to be covered, and the government's going to pay for it. Can you name that president? Or, and that was, he wasn't the president yet, but that was Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Nobody has to worry about health care. Everybody's going to be covered. The government's going to pay for it. And what's notable about that statement, of course, it didn't happen. Of course, he didn't push for it. Of course, he's corrupt. Of course, all the, the uh, pharmaceutical and the health insurance companies got to him and shut that down. But what was notable about when he said that, there was no upheaval from his base. There was no pushback. There was, there was mm -hmm. nothing. Everybody that supported him when he said that thought, that sounds like a good idea. And so we are at this crossroads in this country where some of the lines of left and right, Democrat and Republican are, are blending, whether it's health insurance or whether it's the security state or the FBI or war or all these things. And, and now is the time, as it passed in Dunn County, to, uh, to push this forward and, and break down those lines and kind of unite with our neighbors. Nijmi has, a, has her hand up, has their hand up. Yeah, thanks, Bruce. Um, yeah, definitely really appreciate this. I don't wanna take up a lot of space on your call. Thank you, John, um, for what you said. And I'm familiar with our revolution and our revolution in Pennsylvania and Chuck Pinocchio and folks. Um, I just wanna say that um, I think this is an amazing example of you know, how to build political independence. Um, and I, for that, I think it's fantastic. And then I think that the, the second level is um, that, you know, we, we have to be um, building a base and developing leaders, right? Out of these kinds of processes. And um, that, that's absolutely critical. Um, because we're trying to build permanently organized communities. And I think for the Poor People's Campaign, that's a central um, necessity, right? Not, you know, it, it's great to get people to, to come out and support a resolution. I think that's fantastic. I know that a lot of work goes into talking to people about these things, but also how we, as the Poor People's Campaign, relate to people in an ongoing way is gonna be extremely critical. And I want to say also just that, um, you know, it, it's, it's not just about the fact that, you know, this is a uniting issue for us, which it is, and this is something that we say all the time. It's also a point of weakness for the ruling class, right? We know that uh, part of the issue is that neither party has really put forward a solution, even in the pandemic, right? I mean, there hasn't been a really significant expansion of healthcare in any way. And we know that the ruling class's interest in the healthcare system is literally for for-profit making. And that's fundamentally uh, opposed to our interests in it. And I think we also need to look at the, the lessons. I just wanna, you know, the idea that it's just gonna take electing other people to do this, I think, we really have to um, unpack that concept because we have to look at the lessons from Vermont. We have to look at the lessons of what just happened in New York State as well with their um, healthcare campaign and understand that, you know, politicians will campaign on this 100% because they know how uh, crucial this is, how much people want it, but, you know, they don't have an intention of dismantling <laughs> Uh, the insurance industry, they don't have the intention of dismantling Wall Street, like that is not what they are going to do. So the level of a movement from the bottom up, like we talk about in the Poor People's Campaign, that this is going to require is much, much, much bigger and deeper than simply, oh, we just have to get a different person into office who is going to, you know, do this for us because they understand, like, it's, it's, it's deeper than that, right? Because it's not just about the state, it's about who controls the state. So I just think there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot more important discussions to have and thoughts about, you know, what is the actual strategy to build our base and build our movement and really understand what we're up against. Um, but I think this is a really fantastic, you know, example uh, and appreciate being able to be here tonight.
Thanks, Nijmi. All right, All right. I, think, I think just because we're tight on time, I'm gonna jump in. Uh, that was that a really great, everybody, thank you for sharing um, tonight. And uh, it's been great to learn from all of you and be connected with everybody. I'm just gonna do a quick reminder of some of the um, kind of action steps, you know, just like Nidri was just saying, um, it's actually gonna take a huge movement and all of us building, taking action every day and organizing more people, bring, you know, leaders lead other people. We need to lead by organizing and help other people come into this movement and develop as well. So just to, so here are some, act some actions that we could take, there'll be more. Um, and, and think about how we could do each of these, you know, not just ourselves, but how can we have these actions be ways that we can bring more people into starting to participate, starting to have these conversations. So um, some of the things that were mentioned tonight that we want to just remind people about are um, completing that landscaping, a landscape assessment. The more we can compile these for different areas of our state and look at them together and um, each will help us be smart and strategic about how we build this movement. So um, thank you, Megan, for sharing about that. And if people want to work on that, we can get, be in touch with Megan to get support. And again, think about how you could do that, you know, with two more people from your county who might want to be involved. Um, we also talked a little bit about sharing our story. Or we talked, we've talked a lot about sharing our stories. If you haven't yet, we really want everybody to record um, a story for our We Won't Be Silent Anymore project. It's one of the ways that we lend our voices together. And it really does inspire others to have the confidence that they're not alone. This is not each, anybody's fault and that we can they can share their stories too. So um, you can, if you have not recorded your story yet, um, you can definitely email us at Wisconsin at Poor People's Campaign um, and we'll set up a time to record your story or uh, raise your hand if you know how to record a story and somebody could contact you, reach out. Okay, so there's a few of us on who could help record a story um, if you wanna do that. And we hope you do. Um, and then, um, last but not least, we mentioned um, the Medicaid cutoffs that uh, are that are coming connected to the public health um, emergency. Uh, if, if people didn't see in the news, it uh, looks like that's not coming in January as people thought, but also in the news, there's they're trying to now decouple um, keeping people on Medicaid from that public health emergency so they can keep extending the public health emergency but they can go ahead and start kicking people off Medicaid regardless of whether they extend it or not. That's like kind of the next effort that's coming. Um, so Sally and actually on Becky's, Becky who's on here's um, suggestion, um, Sally helped put together just some basic language to be able to contact um, President Biden and other legislators. So we put that together into a Google doc so that people could um, make those calls, emails, or um, um, or write actual postcards. And um, as we're doing that, please do, you know, we're gonna be organizing around this together with the nonviolent Medicaid army. There's gonna be points where people, a lot of people in our state are gonna lose their health care because of those Medicaid cutoffs. So try to, you know, think about who do, who do we know who's gonna be impacted by this and, and be ready as we figure out what that, how that action will take form, but yeah. So three action steps that everybody can take. So, and then let us know what you're working on and let's keep in touch. I'm sure we will we'll probably keep calling you more than you want. <laughs> All right, Trenton, I'm passing it to you for our sign off chant. Thank you everybody for staying these couple extra minutes. Sorry that we went a little long, but it's been a great conversation. Trenton, All right, ready? thanks Sarah. Yeah, I think I'm ready. <laughs> hey, everybody come on off mute we do this all together so everybody off mute for this he's gonna do it in english and spanish yes you got this trenton did i tell bruce that three days ago i probably did yes uh, he did see <laughs> all right just give me three seconds i need to breathe here <laughs> okay awesome. falling together 
Let's do that again. Forward together. Not, Not one step back. Juntos pa'lante. Ni un paso atrás. Juntos pa'lante. Ni un paso atrás. Gracias a todos y buenas noches. Buenas noches. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank Good night.